Okay, hello. Welcome, all of you, to the Inside the PM Square Labs presentation. It's the last presentation of the day. I know that the only thing standing between you and the open bar is me. So I'll do my best. I'm sure you've seen this before. Okay, so uh, introduction as to who I am. I know many of you in here, for those of you I don't know, my name is Ryan Dolly. I'm a senior solution architect uh, at PM Square is, is probably the capacity that you, uh, you know me in. However, I wear a second hat um, at PM Square and that is I'm the product manager for our custom software development group. So I will be talking to you today not as uh, as a senior solution architect, as the PM uh, for the products that we're going to take a look at. As I'm going through this, if you have questions, just raise your hand and and uh, and we'll take them. So, uh, what what are we going to talk about today's presentation? is called Inside the PM Square Labs. So, we're going to give you a look into uh, some things that we've been working on um, recently some of which you, you may have some experience with or have seen before, some of which you may not have. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is our Thrive product. Uh, I know a number of you have, have had the opportunity to see me present it in the past. Um, we'll do a Thrive demo and we'll talk about the Thrive roadmap, uh, both what is in the, the release that uh, just came out yesterday and um, what is available in our uh, fall and winter release. Um, We'll also be introducing a new capability that we have. For those of you who are in my data modules training course, I mentioned this. Uh, but this is the ability to automatically convert uh, framework manager models into data modules. So uh, for, for those of you who have a significant number of framework manager models and maybe are interested in data modules, uh, but you don't see a very clear path for for moving your existing investment in FM into data modules. Um, I'll be showing how it is that we do that. And then we'll also be talking a little bit about uh, Cognos Paul's bag of tricks. So may or may not demo that. We'll see how much time we have left. Um, I know Paul showed it earlier today, so some of you probably saw it, but I, it would be um, remiss of me not to mention it as one of the things uh, that we offer here at PM Square. So, um, Thrive. Who all here has seen Thrive before in some capacity? Okay, so a decent chunk of the room. For those of you who haven't, um, what Thrive is, is it is uh, kind of like, um, you can think of it as like your audit reporting uh, on steroids, right? So what Thrive does is Thrive ingests information from your audit database, it ingests information from your content store, uh, it does some ETL to make that it easier to report off of that information. And then we present it uh, in a manner that allows you to discover things about what's going on in your Cognos environment. Thrive, um, it's, its product has been on the market now for, um, for about a year. We have a number of customers uh, who are using it. It's, um, it's important to understand that Thrive is not a, it's not like a, a report studio report that we built that we're going, you know, that you deploy within Cognos. It's a, it's a full standalone custom application. It's available to deploy on premise uh, as well as on the cloud. So, you know, whichever you prefer, we, we can accommodate you. It currently works with audit databases and content stores that are running on either SQL Server or Oracle. If you're interested in Thrive, but you're using an Informix content store or, I mean, who knows? You know what what you theoretically could be using for a content store and audit database um, we can can and will accommodate those other databases as they come up in our client base at this time I, I'd say Oracle and SQL Server account for 100% of the Cognos content stores I've ever been involved with in my life so I'm pretty confident that we, we've got you covered there but if you're using something else let me know um, Really the idea behind Thrive is not just to, to present the information, but to make it easy for you to understand what's going on in your environment from the perspective of um, 
How stable is my environment? Am I receiving errors? Are my users receiving errors? If so, what errors are they receiving and what can I do about it, right? Um, from the perspective of your reports, what reports are being used? Who's using the reports? Likewise with your models, um, whether you're, you've got FM models or data modules or data sets, we pull all of that information in to show you who's using them, when are they using them, what reports are built off of what data modules, um, that sort of thing. Um, and then a big focus on adoption. So we're really uh, narrowing in on your users and what are they doing in Cognos to allow you to figure out who's being successful and maybe who needs a little more help, right? Where this, we see this particularly come into play with a lot of our customers is when they choose to, say, go from 10 to 11 or 11.0 to 11.1, and they want to be able to track, now that we have this new version and we've released this new functionality, who is using it and, and who's being successful with it, right? To be able to not only reach out to those users and help them, um, it, say you, you roll dashboards out to 15 people, and you know you see 13 of them are using it regularly, but two aren't. You might want to say, hey, you know, is there something else we can do to help enable you? Do you need additional training? Do you have questions? Right? Be proactive about it to help maintain the, the health and satisfaction of your Cognos user community. Um, we also uh, it, it, to help you show an ROI. Right? We went from 11.0 to 11.1. We decided to turn on the self-service features. We made them available to a subset of our users. And now we have, you know, we've got 15% more people using Cognos. The reports that are being built are being viewed by more people, right? It's important as time goes on, and certainly, you know, if we're being candid in your organization and in all organizations, there are increasing, there's an increasing number of options that your end users will have for what BI tool they choose to use, whether it's Cognos or Power BI or Tableau. Having the ability to show, hey, we, we made an investment in Cognos, we chose to upgrade to the new version, we rolled out the new features, and people are actually using it, um, we find is frequently a powerful thing within our customers uh, when it comes to uh, making the case for uh, Cognos as an enterprise BI tool. So with all that said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and give a demo. Now the, the version I'm gonna be demoing, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, just recently made available. So if you've seen Thrive before, you, you may notice some, um, some differences. And I'll, I will, um, actually I have to, okay, let's see if this works. Hey, success, okay. Um, I'll try to do a, a good mix of pointing out what's new and, and just giving an overview for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. When you come here, um, this is the, kind of the Thrive uh, landing page. We call this the metrics page. And, and what this contains is overall information. Can, it, can people read this or is this entirely too small? Yeah, well, I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, be, do be aware when I zoom in, maybe it will lose a slight degree of its uh, prettiness, but it'll be okay. So let's just go ahead. Uh, all right, tell me when it's good. Let's go up to 100. Or? Yes? No? Heather? Good? Okay. Yeah, so um, what, what do I say about that? It's optimized uh, for viewing on your monitor and not for viewing on a projector. <laughs> so we, we, we actually, we, we recently, it's one of the tweaks in this version is we made everything grayer. We chose to do that. Um, hadn't, thought through the implications for when I'm doing a demo on a projector, but uh, that's okay. It's definitely easier to look at. So um, as you're looking at, at, at Thrive here, let me go ahead and full screen this guy. Make it a little better. Okay, so um, this is a change from, from the version, uh, the previous version. We've kind of redone a little bit of this. So here in the metrics section, we have kind of your overall bread and butter, right? Questions, we, we think of this as questions you get asked. Like how many people use Cognos? How many reports are there? Is it going up or down? Did, how much did it go up or down by, you know, this month versus last month, for example? So we have all that information here. Um, we've split out average wait time and average batch run time. So the difference there, and this is, 
I think kind of gets, it's a simple example, but it gets the core of what we're trying to do with this product, is if you were to just look at your environment and say, how long does it take a report to run? You're going to be looking at both how long someone is sitting at the machine watching the wheel spin, and how long a report is processing on the batch processing service, right? So we've split them out. So you can see average wait time, oops, average wait time reflects how long someone was actually running a report sitting at their computer, whereas um, average batch runtime is, you know, how long are the, the reports that, you're, that are running on the batch service taking to execute, okay? Below that, um, we have a section now called um, reporting utilization. So these are basically all of the interfaces within Cognos um, that someone could uh, be consuming information and um, how many essentially report runs each of those interfaces have. So you notice we have on here now, and we did in the previous version of Thrive, we have um, the exploration feature for those of you who are on 11.1. Um, and then for those of you who are on 11.1.2 and above, the new Jupyter Notebook integration uh, is reflected in here. It actually took a lot of work to try to, try to get out of the audit database what a new Jupyter Notebook execution was. It was not at all obvious uh, when we were putting it together. Below that, in the self-service section, um, and this is when I zoomed way in, you know, we got some uh, size stuff that we need, need to do here to resize this to make it all fit. But in any case, you'll see um, that these are the, the num number of objects that were created in the environment. So um, you might be asking, well, created since when, right? That is all controlled up here with the date range. So by default, it's going to show you the last two weeks. If I want to say, hey, show me um, all of 2019, I click on this year. It'll go ahead and um, reload everything on the screen, and then uh, we're gonna see in a moment. I always, uh, when I demo it, it's like I'm always on some public Wi-Fi or something, it takes a little longer than usual. But um, you can see here, uh, you know, a trend line, and then the number of, of objects that were created now, we're looking at from the 1st of January through the 7th of August. Um, how many reports have been created in the environment, dashboards or explorations, data modules, how many Excel files were uploaded, how many data sets were created, um, all of that uh, in one section. Now, the reason we call that section self-service and the reason we present that information is because we feel it's really important as you move into a self-service world with Cognos and you start to make these features available to people, that you actually keep track of what's going on with them. Are people using them to the degree that you expect it? If not, why, right? Who's using them the most um, and who isn't? That's the type of question that can be answered on this side of the screen by looking in our leaderboards where you see, say, top creators. So these are the people in the environment, and um, it's probably a little hard to read for you guys, but say Jeffrey Larson here has created 138 uh, objects in Cognos, right? Now, why do you want to know that? The reason you want to know that is I find in a lot of my customers, 10 years ago, you knew who your, your power users were. Uh, because they were the people who were bothering you all the time. Because they couldn't really do anything. They had to ask you anytime they wanted anything done in Cognos. Now, uh, especially once you roll out the 11.1 feature set, you'll find that there may be people who are building a lot of stuff in Cognos that's being consumed by other people, and you have no idea because, you know, they started their jobs, someone uh, someone, they said, hey, you need access to the system. They filled out the system request form. You said, yeah, okay. And then you never heard from them again. But they got into Cognos. They said, what is this thing? They looked it up on YouTube. They saw some videos. They started building data modules. And they've never called you to say, hey, I needed the prompt to change, or I would like that, that bar chart to be a line chart. That's where that comes in, right, is giving you that visibility in your user community. So we, we do have customers who have essentially found power users in their Cognos environment through Thrive, not through someone calling up to put in 1,800 requests to the BIDW team. Go ahead. So along that line, a little deeper than that, are, are you, do you have any plans to integrate with Modio or have you ever talked to them? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I'll preface it by saying we have a, a, like a great relationship with Modio. Um, at one point, I don't know if we still are, Chris, maybe you know, we were Modio's number one software reseller for a number of years. So um, we are trying to, 
There have been times where we've come up with features where we've made the decision that that's a little Modio-esque and we don't necessarily want to do it. Now, the other thing we've considered is Modio actually has an API. And so um, we could integrate with that API to allow you to use, say, the PI Pro feature set from within Thrive. That's not on our roadmap. It's, it's remember that disclaimer statement? Um, but it's a very interesting idea that I think we'd like to continue to discuss with them. I mean, even here you could have sort of like people who have taken revisions and those type of things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that would be great to have. And the other thing, um, and you'll see some of it in here, and there'll be more in the, in the fall release, is things like, uh, we've all had that experience where we're upgrading Cognos, and you're like, man, I have 2,700 reports, and like, I know in my heart that 2,000 of these nobody has looked at. But I don't know which 2,000 it is, right? Now, we, we, we do, um, we sort of surface that sort of information Thrive today. We'll have a feature in the fall that will make it very easy for you to identify that. Now, if we were able to integrate with Modio, then there'd be a button in there where you could say, okay, archive it and automatically move it to the archive folder in your environment. Um, that's, that was the type of thing that I think would be great if, if we went down that path. Which again, maybe, maybe not. That was a great question though. Um, so and everything on here, basically every noun, right? If you click on a noun, it will uh, pop open a, a drill through. So if I'm taking a look at this and I see my longest running reports, I have the yearly IT report. It's the longest running report at, at 47 seconds. If the longest running report in your Cognos environment only runs for 47 seconds, I congratulate you. Um, but uh, if you click on it, it's going to go ahead and pop open a detailed drill through where you can see, okay, um, it has 231 executions. How many were on the interactive service? How many were on the batch service? And how many of those were not ex executions? They were actually individuals who were looking at report views. And that's an important thing that we've done in here that um, for those of you who've been using Cognos for a while, I think is important to take a second to explain, which is we go through your content store and we look at every report view and we figure out what base report that report view references. And then we roll all of those executions or views up into a single um, object, right? So whether someone's looking at a, a PDF of a report or they're looking at a PDF of the report view that references the report, it all shows up in this detail drill. Um, any of you who's a, who've ever tried to do that know that it's like, it's not fun um, to do on your own. Now from here I can see, you know, I have ex average execution time, I can see the data source or data sources that this report is built off of. An important thing to keep in mind now that we're in the Cognos 11 world, you can have a report that has, is built off of more than one package. Um, you can have a dashboard that's built off of like a gazillion data modules. We'll capture all that information and put it in here. Um, and then I can look at this, I can see the users, the number of executions, the trend line of those executions, the percent of those executions that resulted in a failure. Uh, every list in Thrive has embedded filters. These are just type filters where if I start typing, um, you know, I type J, it's going to give me everybody who has a J. It doesn't have to requery to get any of this information. Those of you who've worked with the audit reports know that some of the audit reports take a long time to run. This is the type of analysis you might be sitting there a while um, to get the results for. I can also see, and I don't think, yeah, this one only has one report view, right? So this is a report view object that references the report I'm looking at. And then if I'm curious, I can actually see each individual execution of the report. How long did it take? It's a remarkably consistent report. Um, did it have an error? If so, what was the error code? Which application server processed that report run. Uh, so right now we just have the IP address of that application server, but in the fall release we'll give you the ability, thank you Rory, I think for suggesting this, um, give you the ability to define within, because nobody calls their application servers or by the IP address, right? You have a name for it. It's cogapp01, cogapp02. You'll be able to put that in here instead of using the, the IP. Anytime you see a list in Thrive, you can of course download a CSV or an Excel of that data. So if there's a chart you'd like that's not in Thrive, of course you can request it. Um, but you can also export the data 
uh, and you know, do whatever you want with it at that point. Um, so this is the, again, this is the metrics view. If I, if I look over at the top of the screen, you'll see we have three sections in what we call environment. This is reporting, adoption, and data sources. In here, you could see, let's say I want to see every um, user in the environment. That would be the adoption tab. I click on the adoption tab. Once it loads in, it's, it's a little restricted due to how much I've zoomed in, but I, I think you guys will get the point. These are the users, the number of report runs, how many failures they've had the top report that that individual executes, um, the percent that they're running in interactive versus batch, right? So is this a person who, is, um, uh, who is, has scheduled a lot of reports and they're just receiving them, or is this someone who's actually running prompted reports or something like that? So all that type of information we have in here. Again, anything in here, um, you can see a detail pop up. So if I wanna look at, say, well, who, who runs the most reports in my environment? It's Jeffrey Larson, okay. Tell me about Jeffrey Larson. I click on his name. I get that detail pop up with the information about him. Yeah. Uh, can I have that filtered by folder? Like if I'm only interested in one folder? Yeah. Hold that thought and we'll get there. <laughs> That's a great question though. Um, we have the same thing if I were to say look at reporting. You'll see in here, and, and this is um, one of the new features that we've added. And this most recent release of Thrive was a lot of um, formatting type stuff and uh, background stuff to enable what you're gonna see in the next two releases. So uh, one of the things, if you've seen this before, you may know that these, these uh, points used to be incredibly tiny. They were very hard to see. We, we made them bigger. And um, we colored it by uh, data source, right? So um, everything here, these green, uh, are all coming off of the operations cube, right? Um, all of these pink ones are coming off of the financial data cube. Of course, you can turn that off if you want, and then everything will be blue. Uh, as far as the, the utility section is concerned, there are two things that we have in here today. So the first one um, that I wanna show is what we call our issue tracker. The way this works, is um, Thrive is getting a load of data from your content store and your audit database. By default, I think it's every five minutes. It is configurable, right? Now, what this will do is it, these are um, issues that Thrive has detected in your environment that it thinks you should be aware of, right? So the blue ones are what we call adoption issues. These are, hey, someone used to use Cognos. Like, this is an inactive user. They used to use Cognos. They stopped. Now, maybe... Um, that matters a lot to you, maybe it doesn't. You can configure how these cards are generated. Um, but I would suggest that it's something you should at least be interested in. Occasionally you see a user's name pop up on here that's very unexpected. Like, hey, this someone, person used to be a power user and now they've popped up on the inactive users list, why is that, right? This type of thing you might want to investigate. The green cards are poorly performing reports. And then I think uh, most interesting, these yellow cards, if you scroll down, I scroll down, are, um, are going to show recurring errors. So if I were to click on one of these, it'll give me some information which server was affected by this error, um, who was affected by the error, the trend over time, show me the individual events that resulted in that error code, right? So these are all different reports. They could be different reports. They could be totally different interfaces. Some of them could be report authoring. Some of them could be dashboards. Some of it could be people trying to preview data in a data module and running into a query execution error. It'll all be captured right here. And then you can click on search IBM support and it will go to IBM support page and pop in the, um, uh, that error code to just give you a little jump start on, on troubleshooting um, what you have there. The other thing, a uh, couple things that I, I would show in this release of Thrive before we get into the roadmap are going to be, um, currently we have a custom grouping capability. So you can see these are groups that have been made in, um, in past demos. I can take a look at say analytics rollout phase one. These are all the users in that group. I can update that, remove users, add users. Um, but once I have that, I can go ahead and choose analytics rollout phase one and now it's only gonna show me the errors encountered by those people, 
right? So I'm not looking at all the errors in the entire environment, just the ones by those people. If I go over to the reporting view, now I'm going to be looking at the 1st of January through the 7th of August, 2019. For the individuals in the analytics rollout group one group, what reports have those people run in Cognos? Go ahead. Does that tie to AD groups? Not today. So um, that's something we've been working on. It's probably going to be a, a two-step process. So the first step will be you can export from AD a CSV or Excel of your AD groups and the individuals who are in those groups and then load them up into Thrive and we will ingest it and automatically create groups for those people. And then further down the road, um, we'll be looking at directly integrating with AD. Good question. question. Yes. Can you send alerts through this? Uh, we'll get to that in a second too. Good question, yeah. So. Um, just a couple other things I'll show in here. Uh, they have a light and a dark theme. This is the, the most hotly debated item. Um, I'm a light theme guy. Everybody assures me I'm wrong. Uh, I'm sure they're wrong. So um, there's a light and a dark theme. There are, as far as the cards are considered, if you go into the admin settings, there's a couple things you can do in here. I think it's worth highlighting. The first one is um, invite users. So if you, know, if you have Thrive, we will make someone in your organization an admin user. And then it's like an in email invite uh, system where you add someone in here, they get an email, they register, um, they appear. Now, sometimes you have, say you have uh, an account, like a system account or your developers that you do not want to show up in the Thrive statistics. Here you can add them to the hidden users uh, feature and it will just pull them out of Thrive, right? So, you know, you've got that, that dummy user that's running all your batch processes. If for whatever reason you just don't want that in here, you add it to this list and they'll disappear. The final thing is, is those, those cards um, have a uh, kind of configuration thresholds. So every organization is different, right? What counts as a poorly performing report? Here it's set to 30 seconds. For you maybe it's two minutes, right? Or it's five minutes. Um, here's where you, you configure how many uh, how many report runs do you want it to look back over? So I, I want it to look back over 100 report runs. And if in the last 100 report runs, the average execution time is above one minute, then I want you to generate this card. Otherwise, don't. Um, or you can turn it off entirely, where you say, you know what? I don't want those at all. Now it won't make them. So um, there's, there's more I could show here, but for the sake of time, um, I'm going to return to my PowerPoint slides. Are there any, real quick, just a question, does anybody have a question about uh, what you've seen so far? Okay. So what, um, what's coming? Well, this is kind of what we just looked at. There's some things that I couldn't show, um, like installation improvements and performance improvements. Obviously, those are demo, but, um, but those are, are facets of this release. I think uh, what you will be more interesting uh, to talk about is what's coming in November. So um, in November, the, the first thing, set date time display to local time zone. Right now it's in um, uh, Greenwich Mean Time, everything is, because that was just uh, easier, but we've gotten a lot of feedback, like I don't want it in Greenwich Mean Time, I need to set it to my local time. So um, you'll have the capability to do that. Uh, likewise, um, assigning the names to the app servers, like I mentioned. Now the, those are cool, um, but the things that we're gonna show, uh, at least a preview of, are advanced filtering, schedules and jobs, and email alerts, okay? So all of this is currently targeted for November 2019. Advanced filtering, um, some uh, mock-up uh, that we built, probably won't look exactly like this, but this is what we're thinking. What advanced, advanced filtering will replace the group capability, right? So what advanced filtering will do, well, it will allow you to come in here and say, I would like to make a filter for the following users who have run the following reports or you know, using the following data in these folders that was processed on these servers. Any combination of that stuff. I, I only want to see reports that use this package and exist in this folder. Save. And then you'll be able to come back into Thrive and view statistics for that combination of items at any time. Um, so that's, that's the first major feature for that release. The second one, schedules and jobs. Um, 
we have a lot of requests to make Thrive, uh, it's, it's, people find it very useful analytically, but to make it more operationally useful. So I, I need to know what's happening in Cognos like right now, you know? So the first iteration of that is gonna be schedule as in jobs. We're gonna take all of your scheduled reports and all of your jobs, we'll display them here. Um, and then uh, over here you're gonna get um, what's coming up. So what's, what hasn't run yet, but is, remains in today's schedule. The most recent jobs that failed, scheduled, scheduled jobs that failed, you'll be able to see all of those here. Of course you'll have the full drill through capability, so if a report fails, you can click on it and see you know, who typically receives this report? Is there an important name on there? Do I need to contact them, right? Um, scheduling anomalies um, and abandoned schedules. Abandoned schedules are something that's been running for a long time that nobody has looked at. So we're gonna surface all that information so at the very least, you can stop running that thing, right? There's no reason for it to consume resources in your Cognos environment when, uh, when nobody's looking at it, right? Scheduling anomalies is um, we're gonna take a look at all your schedules and how long they typically take to run. When this report is scheduled, it usually runs in seven minutes. If its execution is more than two standard deviations away from seven minutes in either direction, then we're gonna plop it into the scheduling anomalies section. So this is telling you this report finished, but something wasn't quite right because it took, ran way too quickly or it took way too long. Right? And so that will either help you figure out like, hey, the report ran, the ETL was late, and the report ran and there was no data, or um, we've got you know, too much stuff running and Cognos wasn't able to process the report efficiently, it took way longer than usual. The examples of things that we hope you can uncover from there. And then the final thing is, this is, it's probably impossible to see, but this is the number one through 24, so these are the 24 hours in the day. This is right now. And this is, this bar chart, stack bar chart will show you what status are all of the scheduled items in. Have they been completed? That would be the green ones. Did they fail? That would be the red. Are they still running? Um, that's the yellow one, right? So you'll be able to come in here and understand from a scheduling perspective what is going on in your Cognos environment. Again, it's generally like a five minute delay. The final feature uh, that we're going to be releasing in fall is uh, notifications. So when a card is created, should someone get an email? If so, who is that person? On a card-by-card -card basis and for the overall environment. So you can kind of see here, this is that user interface for the, um, the issue cards that I showed earlier. And you can see for the adoption inactive, here are the alert recipients. So anytime this card is generated, it should email me and Lucas. right? So um, as it stands today, when you go into Thrive, it doesn't tell you, hey, this report aired out, right? It, you have to go in and look at it. As of the fall release, somebody will get an email. Um, for February, we're, we're, we're in the process of finalizing what features are gonna be included in there. So, um, Cobwebs and Orphans is, is uh, I think, it's one that I like. Um, it's, it's basically, a, a cobweb is anything that hasn't been used in X amount of time, and an orphan is anything whose, whose user, the user who created it, or own, well, anything that doesn't have an owner. So, as we all know, someone builds a report, they leave the company, they're no longer an active directory, that object no longer has an owner in Cognos. Is that a huge deal? Usually, no. But occasionally things will happen in Cognos where suddenly the fact that these objects don't have an owner causes a huge problem. So we want to proactively notify you of that um, so that you have that information. Uh, Thrive data available in BI tools. Um, under the scene, uh, Thrive is, is actually running on MongoDB, right? So one thing we've discussed is, well, should we configure the MongoDB BI connector so that you can point Cognos or Power BI or Tableau or whatever, directly to the Thrive database so that you can make whatever type of report you'd want with our data. Um, these are just ideas, right? Um, ability to alter Cognos from Thrive, that would be uh, Modio integration, real-time view. The point of this is that we are, we are finalizing this in the next, um, we'll be finalizing this in the next few weeks. And we have an ideas site that you can go to where you can enter ideas for Thrive or vote for them um, 
And, and we're basing our development off of what people say. You know, it's a combination of the dict my dictatorial whims and, uh, and the things that people vote for, right? So if you're interested in Thrive, this is not just Thrive customers who, um, who can use this. Um, so if you go to this site, you will see our ideas portal. You will see the ideas that people have put in there. You will see that a lot of them are from me. But a lot of them are from other people. Um, Paul, you have one in there, right? And yours is uh, very highly... It, it was high, it got upvoted, it's the most upvoted request ever made. And so, um, and so it's in, in the uh, fall release. So please go to this site um, and vote for things. We'll be making these decisions in the next few weeks. Okay, I'm, I'm coming up on, uh, I don't have a whole lot of time here, so we're, we're gonna try to blaze through some stuff. How do you get it? Well, there's a, a 30 day trial. If you go to pmsquare.com slash thrive, you can download a 30 day trial of the software. We'll help you install it. Um, otherwise, talk to me um, or Chris uh, if you're interested. So the second thing we want to talk about, FM to DM conversion. How do I do this? This is a, Everybody who sees data modules, I think, wonders, well, I've got all these framework manager models. How, can I upgrade them? The answer is no. Uh, Mike McGeehan, who's the IBM product manager for data modules, told me he gets asked this like every week. Um, and the answer uh, has always been no. So we, um, we have a process that will do this. Um, it reads in the, the FM model XML, converts it into a data module. It converts most of what's available in uh, FM. Now for things where there's no feature mapping, like you can't build a DMR in a data module today, so we're not gonna convert your DMR elements to a data module, it doesn't make sense, right? We, we straight up can't, like there's no real analog. Um, but it does all the things you see there. The other thing it does, and this is maybe gonna be a little hard to wrap your head around until you get familiar with data modules is data modules do not have a three-tiered structure, database layer, business layer, presentation layer. It's one layer, right? So we read through your presentation layer, your alias shortcuts, your business layer, and your database layer, and we collapse all that down into a single layer in a data module. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So um, let's do that, again, because I don't wanna uh, keep, keep you guys, or, or myself, frankly, uh, from the open bar. Okay, so uh, can we all agree that this data module uh, has nothing in it? No, we can't. <laughs> One moment. All right, now can we all agree that this data module has nothing in it? Yes? Okay. Now, um, as you're looking at this, keep in mind that, that what this is uh, currently is not, it's not a, a product you buy, it's a service that we offer, right? So it doesn't have a fancy UI or anything like that, um, but I will show you uh, how it works. So um, if I go ahead and, is this the right, no, I think I wanna kick it off from here. So this is, again, an, an application we've written um, that I'm going to trigger like so. Oop. Okay. You say it says converting framework manager to data module, one input found, all right? Model XML was written as 7032. You don't need to know what that means right now, but if you're curious, we'll talk about it later. And it says it's done. Let's take a look um, at what we have in this data module now. So, of course, in order to get this to show, frequently I have to log out um, and then log back in, so I'll go ahead and do that. Now, if this doesn't work, you guys will vouch for me that it worked yesterday, right? Okay. Now we should be able to see here Ryan Target. And there you go. This data module. <laughs> now, what did I build that off of? Just to, to show you what all it, it, it did, let's go ahead and open uh, Framework Manager here. And you'll see that we have a, um, not huge, but a fairly um, feature 
rich uh, framework manager model. Always with the logging in. Okay. So um, it built off of Go Sales. It's a three-tier model. You can see um, that it has, for example, if I were to look at uh, something in here, if we look at package A, you can see I've got um, like product SQL. This is the table that's built off of SQL that was input directly into FM. We're able to convert that. Um, we're able to convert the filter objects that you can build in, uh, within Framework Manager. Uh, but you can see in here where I have um, sales, right? So what is sales? Well, if I look at sales, sales contains this information. Well, well where does this information come from? It's actually a combination of order header and order details, right? So what our conversion process did is it came in here and said, I've got uh, an alias shortcut called sales. Um, what is sales? Okay, sales is referencing this in the business layer. Okay, well, what is that? Sales is a combination of order header and order detail from the database view. Uh, what we did is we pull in both of those tables and the join that is necessary to build the model query subject known as sales, and you can see that right here. So there's the join between the order, order header and the order details table. We pull the order header, order details table in, we pull in the join, we create a data modules view object called sales, and then we take the order header and order details table and we nest them lovingly in a folder called um, data source tables so that any table that is not exposed to your end users, but is used in your FM model to do something gets put into that table, in that folder, and all of the other tables that are exposed to your end users are left at the root level of the data module. And then if you so wish, you can just come in here and hide that uh, so that they can't see that. Any questions about that? Two minutes, okay. Yes. Does, does that, is that gonna honor uh, point grain access control? So um, it depends uh, on what you're doing, right? Um, it, it is able to take a look at if you're doing security, say you're doing security in, in such a way where you're saying, okay, this LDAP group can only see these values from this column. Um, it will do that. Well, we you set a policy basically on the data source. Mm -hmm. So when we you're creating an extract from the model and you're creating the data module yeah I, i'm just wondering how is it going to retain yeah so what what it, yeah what so what it um what it, it does is it, it looks at whatever data source is being used in the fm model and it automatically applies that data source to the data module so in, it, and then when they execute the data module the question is will FGAP yeah it, so it again it depends on on how you have it set up we can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question though. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Other questions? Okay. Um, One more question? Yeah. Do you have Thrive for uh, Tableau? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, do we have Thrive for Tableau? Um, no. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so then the, the final thing uh, that I want to mention here before, um, before we close, where did my, okay. So um, right now it's available as, a, as an engagement. I have on here one to two weeks. It, honestly, um, it may take a lot less time than that. It depends on what we're doing, right? Um, we, we come on site and, and we provide a conversion of your models. That's really what this is designed for right now. Now, if you are like, I really only want this one model converted, um, then we can talk, right? But as it exists, we're just like, this is actually the first time we've ever publicly discussed this capability. So um, right now, what we have it targeted for is, hey, I have seven FM models. It's gonna take me eight months to uh, build data modules off of all of these. We'll come in and over the course of a week, we'll migrate everything into data modules for you. Uh, we have some, additional ideas of how, um, how we may use this in the future that we will um, please come back to Bacon next year. There will be some very exciting things that we'll be announcing around these capabilities, but I can't get into it now. 
Um, if you're interested, contact me or, or uh, Dustin. The final thing I want to talk about before we close here today is um, Cognos Paul's bag o tricks. Um, so what is this? Um, I made sure Paul knew that I put on here world famous Cognos guru. Um, but uh, Paul developed a couple extensions. These are Cognos extensions that allow you to do really useful things as you're developing reports. So we've all been in a situation where like, you know, I've developed a report and now I want to test it with a number of different param values, right? That can kind of be a pain in the butt. Um, and when what Paul has done is made it easier for you to swap out param values within reports um, and to edit objects in the clipboard directly within Cognos without pulling it out of Cognos and pasting it in Notepad++ and doing your edits there. Um, right to do that sort of thing. I have some uh, screenshots of it. I'm not going to demo it because we're out of time. Um, but if you're interested in it, talk to Paul. The important thing um, is that uh, this is free. So if you go to pmsquare.com slash freebies, you can uh, provide us with your contact information and then we will give you a zip file. That zip file is uh, a Cognos extension. We also give you instructions on how to import it into Cognos, at which point um, the, this feature set will be available within report authoring. So, questions? Uh, we've had some good ones so far. Anything else before we wrap up today?